Good evening, everyone. Welcome here this evening. My name is Greg Natterer. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science. And it's a pleasure for me to, to uh, introduce our guest speaker and to welcome you here this evening. Thank you for supporting this Speaking of Engineering lecture series that we hold throughout the year regularly. I'd like to extend a special greeting and thanks to our guest speaker this evening to my right, Dan Harris, who is the refinery manager at North Atlantic Refinery Limited at Come By Chance. I'd also like to acknowledge Jeff Emberley to, uh, to my left, who is the CEO and registrar of Peganel, that is professional engineers and geoscientists of Newfoundland and Labrador. Jeff will come up a little later to speak on, uh, on behalf of Peganel uh, about this lecture series. This session is co-sponsored by Peganel. As you may know, Peganel is an orga a provincial organization with the mandate of regulating the profession of engineering and geoscience professions in the public interest. There are approximately 4,000 members of Peganel uh, across the province, and we are grateful to Peganel for co-sponsoring this, this series with us. Just a few housekeeping items for us to be aware of before we get started. Uh, in, the, uh, in, in the event of an emergency, we should exit this room calmly to the back. Uh, there are two exits at the back and one here at the front. We should exit through the back, turn right, and then go out immediately through the main um, exits of the building. As we go out, we then turn left and go over to Muster Station in Lot 22, which is the parking lot beside the business building across, across the street. Also, uh, as you probably know, washrooms are in the main lobby and they're to the left after you exit. So this lecture series is very important to us here in engineering as it raises the awareness profile uh, of engineering among students and the general public and community. We're very proud of the exceptional work that we do here in the faculty. And just to give you an example of recent success, you've probably all heard of the Hyperloop Paradigm team, which uh, recently placed second in the world in the international SpaceX competition by developing the world's first uh, air levitating pod that can uh, reach speeds of over 100 kilometers an hour. It was the only air bearing design done in the world. They place first in North America and they, that's a, an amazing achievement considering there were initially 1,200 teams that applied. Tonight's lecture is about the importance of engineering in process safety management. Effective process safety management requires the alignment of quality design and engineering operations and maintenance. These elements working together ensure the safety and integrity of process systems in industry. Also, perfect alignment of gaps in, or flows in process safety layers of protection can unfortunately or potentially cause catastrophic results this is sometimes known as the Swiss cheese lineup for failure. With more than 35 years of refinery experience, Mr. Harris will share his vast knowledge of process safety management and connection to this Swiss cheese analogy. And by the way, I think we may have some Swiss cheese Swiss at cheese the back right after, so just. <laughs> <laughs> he will discuss the concept of building safety into a project to reduce the likelihood of incidents and their consequences, a concept known as inherently safe design. Mr. Harris came to Newfoundland and Labrador in 2015 to take on the uh, role of management of our province's only oil refinery. He has 35 years of refining experience and he's thus well positioned in his goal to move North Atlantic refining forward in its quest to become a first quartile refinery. He was born in Alabama and earned a BSc degree in mechanical engineering from Auburn University in Alabama and later received a Master's of Science in Chemical Engineering 
from Lamar University in Texas. He has held management positions with Mobile, BP, Am Amico, and Western Refining in the United States. He's also worked in the areas of maintenance, refinery operations, process engineering, capital projects, and procurement. Please join me in welcoming Dan Harris this evening. Good. Thank you for that introduction. I, I find it interesting the SpaceX Prize. So, uh, so the original X Prize. I have a friend who uh, had an entrant into the. Uh, anybody heard of the X Prize before? So Matt has. Okay, uh, one of my plants. The <laughs> softball questions. Uh, uh, Jim Ackerman is a rocket scientist friend of mine, and he entered the original X Prize, which was to launch a private rocket. Um, to duplicate uh, Alan Shepard's original um, ride into uh, into space, not into orbit, but into into space, and uh, he didn't win. Uh, Bert Rutan won that X Prize, but uh, that's a different story. Um, so we're here tonight to talk about the engineer's role in process safety. We. Um, There we go. All right. So a little about my background, the, the bachelor's degree from uh, Auburn University in mechanical engineering, a picture of the campus there, War Eagle, and uh, then the master's at uh, Lamar University. So I started working on the master's in chemical engineering shortly after getting the bachelor's, uh, going to school at night at, at Lamar, which was in Beaumont, where uh, I took my first assignment out of school. And 35, okay, we'll say 36 years of refining experience at Mobile Oil, mainly at the Beaumont Refinery. And I say BP Amico, I, I left Mobile and joined Amico, and then Amico got bought by BP. So uh, primarily at the Texas City Refinery, we'll talk a, a bit about Texas City here in a minute. And then um, Western Refining in El Paso, the high desert of West Texas. So it was uh, not much of a change to go from the high desert of West Texas to Newfoundland. So, all right. <laughs> we'll get the hang of this clicker in a minute. Um, and then we talked some about this, but I want to elaborate a little bit. Um, these are some of the positions that I've held. And my point in bringing all this stuff up is not to talk about myself so much as to, uh, we want to talk about what engineers roles are in process safety management. And you're, whether you're a process safety management engineer, we have our, our PSM engineer is here tonight, Mark Kinney. Uh, but all engineers in a refinery and a lot of the operations, maintenance, a lot of people have uh, an impact on process safety management. So it's not just the safety engineers, not just process safety, but um, all of the people that are uh, filling these roles. So I was a, a maintenance and reliability engineer early in my career. Um, later, I moved into project engineering, building uh, new plants and, and installing uh, you know, capital improvement projects, and then uh, moved into operations management, and later into engineering management. Even a, as a procurement director, procurement has a role in process safety. I don't know if anybody here is involved in procurement or purchasing, but you know, purchasing the right stuff has a big impact on the safety of a plant. Um, other things that I've done, a couple of uh, special assignments. I was the, my first um, operations job was at a, a liquefied petroleum gra gas underground storage facility. So that, that's a facility that uh, uh, stores LPG propane, butane, uh, can store pentane, but protein, propane, butane, ethane, um, even compressed natural gas underground in uh, salt dome storage. So I was brought into that job after uh, a catastrophic leak. So it over, essentially overpressured a portion of one of the wells and had a, an ethane fire 
a methane fire that went. The flame didn't start for about 100 feet up off of the surface, and then it extended up 500 feet. So they'd had a loss of containment, and uh, I came in afterwards, uh, about a month afterwards, and took over the LPG facility, and uh, we installed uh, safety systems, interlocks, stuff to make it uh, not foolproof, but make it very difficult to have another release like that. The um, Operation Phoenix. Everybody heard of the Phoenix? So the Phoenix is a bird that rises up out of the ashes right after a fire. And so uh, Operation Phoenix was um, after a crude unit fire. So we had, this was at Mobile Oil and um, we'd had a, a big leak and a big fire. Nobody got hurt at either of these first couple of uh, incidents I'm talking about. But we'd had a loss of containment and a big fire on a crude tower bottoms. So the crude tower had an uncontrolled release and basically emptied the bottom of the crude tower. And as it did, the uh, product is a, above its auto ignition temperature. There were no remote isolation devices to block in the, the, the flow of product. And the unit continued to burn for like 12 hours. Nobody was injured, but it caused a lot of damage. I'll say hundreds of thousands of dollars, but this was back in the 80s. So if you put that in today's terms, it would be millions and millions of dollars. But uh, uh, anyway, we repaired that. So I was brought in often to be the fixer, not the, not the breaker in these things, uh, but to put things back together after process safety events had happened. And then finally, we'll, we'll talk a good bit about uh, this particular job that I had at uh, BP Texas City. So in Texas City, there was a major catastrophic event. None of my, the other ones that I've talked about resulted in any loss of life. But Texas City, uh, the BP explosion at Texas City, March 23rd, 2005, about 1.15 in the afternoon, a lot of lives were lost, a lot of lives were changed forever. Uh, when, uh, when we had an uncontrolled release, a vapor cloud explosion, and 15 people died, and 170 to 200 people were injured, and even the survivors were b badly injured. So um, a lot of learnings from that, and we'll talk some about that. There's a, uh, in this job, restoration and recovery manager, my job was to uh, uh, recover the, um, the assets, recover um, the uh, evidence that the Chemical Safety Board used in uh, doing their detailed investigation. The Chemical Safety Board, BP had its own investigation, plaintiff's attorneys had their own investigations, but my, my, me and my group, we, uh, we recovered the evidence, tested the instruments, tested the vessels, really uh, did all the forensic work that led into the, the, the stuff that you see on chemical safety board websites and stuff like that about this terrible event. So when, when things happen in process safety, um, you know, the word travels, thank God. Uh, word gets around, we, we find out what it was that happened so that everybody can learn from it. So let's talk about what process safety management is and what it's not. So process safety is not the same thing as personal safety. Personal safety is important, you know. We want to eliminate slips, trips, falls. We want to eliminate, you know, uh, people getting pinched. We want to eliminate, um, we want to eliminate people falling from heights and stuff like that. So that's personal safety. Process safety is a set of interrelated elements intended to manage the hazards in the process industry by reducing the frequency and severity of incidents resulting from the release of chemicals and other energy sources. So um, notice that it doesn't say the word eliminate. It says the word reduce, reduce the frequency and severity. So as long as we've got processes, as long as we got oil and gas, we got iron and steel, and we have people involved, there's 
a possibility of having these events happen. Uh, our goal is to reduce the, the frequency and to reduce, reduce the likelihood and reduce the consequence. This really all started, process safety really started, there were some events back in the 70s and 80s, but uh, process safety really um, became prevalent after the Phillips explosion at a Phillips chemical plant in 1989 in LaPorte, Texas. And uh, it said that I was a uh, LPG storage superintendent. So I was, um, I was working in the industry as uh, doing that job out at a little town called Hull, Texas. You gotta have a really good map to find Hull, Texas. It's the middle of nowhere. And uh, I was on the phone with our supply group, which was in Houston. If you've been to Houston, this is in Greenway Plaza in Houston. It's uh, kind of the center of town near where the Houston Rockets used to play basketball. And uh, the staff was, was in their, their building and this, uh, this explosion had just taken place at the Phillips chemical plant. And the people I was talking to in the office, which is about 20 miles away from uh, the Laporte chemical plant for Phillips, they were terrorized because there was a huge black cloud of smoke from that explosion drifting towards them. And they were asking me, you know, what, what do I do? I said, well, it, it's, it's probably dissipated by the time it gets to you, but uh, you know, don't, don't hang around there. But the, the sheer terror in the people's voice, a town at that time of two million people, the whole town was terrorized from this event. So after that, in about 1992, is when the OSHA 1910-119 came into being, which is uh, all about process safety management. So what are the engineer's roles in uh, PSM? So I said everybody's got a, got a role in this. Um, so engineer, people that go into engineering, some of them go in thinking that their job, they're going into engineering because they can make lots of money. But really as an engineer, your, your job is, is public service. So you're serving the public you're working in process safety management to prevent a, a big smoke cloud, vapor cloud from traveling over two million people um, that, uh, you know, terrorizing people in 20 miles away from an event. Uh, you're also a risk management. So what is risk? Have y'all heard, you know, heard of risk? What really is risk? Risk is, you know, the probability and consequences. So we manage risk by reducing the probability or reducing the consequences down to a manageable level so that events are, are controlled properly. Um, and one, one, of, one way we could do that is just shut everything down. So if a plant is not running, it's pretty safe, right? Kind of like I've, I've, I've heard it said about a ship. The safest place for a ship is in the harbor, but that's not what we built ships for. We didn't build ships to sit them, keep them in the harbor all the time. Likewise, the safest, the safest state for a processing plant is shut down. But why are we gonna build it if we're gonna shut it down? So our job as engineers, our job as uh, you know, leaders in, our, in the industry is to uh, manage that risk somewhere between running out of control and having uncontrolled releases that kill and terrorize people to uh, somewhere between that and just being completely shut down is where we manage the risk. So after this, this event happened in uh, Phillips 1989, process safety came out and uh, there's, um, in Canada, there's uh, 12 elements. Uh, it's the same stuff in the US, I think they have 14 elements, but uh, they, it's the US, they gotta have a little bit more really covers the same thing, it's just how you divide it up. So, accountability, that's the first element. Uh, you may see these in different orders depending on uh, wh where you look. So accountability is a continuation of operations. So that has to do with uh, continuing to run the plant safely. Um, organizational continuity, so 
making sure that uh, uh, when we have changes in the organization that we don't lose ground, that we don't, uh, we have a proper turnover of personnel and that we don't lose ground in process safety. Um, management accessibility is another element, uh, dealing with uh, ability for somebody at the, you know, the custodian to have access to the right level of management to, um, you know, voice any concerns that they have relating to process safety. Another one was uh, just setting expectations of the staff. Make sure that everybody has roles and responsibilities and is accountable for, for doing their job. Process risk management is, uh, has to do with identifying hazards, uh, doing risk analysis during operations. So we talk about that probability and consequences. That's what we do 24 seven. So the people that are operating the plant are making those judgment calls uh, right now out at our refinery on uh, operating the plant safely, reducing the, or having the right level of list risk and uh, uh, managing the consequences. And then managing emergencies is another one. So another element of PSM is to make sure that you have proper re emergency response procedures, emergency response staff and stuff like that. And human factors. So that has to do with uh, HMI. Heard of HMI, Craig? Yeah. So human machine interface. So that's the, the interface between the, the people that are doing the work and the machines that they're operating. Um, administrative versus engineering control. We can't solve all of our problems just by engineering the, the solution. Sometimes we have to install administrative controls to prevent, uh, to prevent events. And then human error assessment. That's another analysis that we do to, and that involves looking at uh, doing these things called quantitative risk assessments, where we analyze, okay, this, this particular activity, is it a high risk activity? How often are the people doing it? Are they properly trained? And uh, are they conversant in it? Or do we need to retrain them? Training and performance is another one. Um, defining skill requirements, selecting the right personnel for the job, and then measuring performance, and then uh, management of change. So when we change a process, when we change a facility, um, make sure that the facility and the organization are, are good to go when we manage the change, when we do the change. And then incident investigations. So learning from incidents, learning from uh, events like Texas City, learning from near misses. So there's, uh, those of you that have read some on Texas City, the best book on that event is one called uh, A Failure to Learn. And that has to do with uh, really about this um, incident investigation. Had one of the layers of Swiss cheese that we'll talk about in a minute, had the organization learned from previous events that didn't actually result in a vapor cloud explosion or a loss of life or damage to uh, the facility, had they learned from that, the whole event would have uh, not taken place. And 15 people, I actually counted to 16, uh, would be with us today and a lot of others would uh, not have had their families affected the way, the way that they were. Okay, other elements. Company standards, codes, uh, both uh, government codes um, environmental code, safety standards, uh, audits and corrective actions. That's uh, one that we, uh, another one that would have prevented Texas City, a proper audit. So people don't do what you expect, they do what you inspect, right? So just putting a, a standard out there, you don't have the feedback loop to make sure that things are actually being implemented and executed the way you, you have on paper. You have to audit to make sure that that's happening properly. And uh, so we'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Um, and then enhancing process safety knowledge, continuous improvement, learning from others, learning from, you know, you don't have to have the incident at your facility, learn from other incidents uh, in the industry. So enhancing process safety knowledge. And then these next three we'll talk about in a little more detail. Capital project review and design procedures, 
process equipment and mechanical integrity, and then process knowledge and documentation. So the capital project review, this is, um, all I should have said this at the start, any pictures that I put up are not from my personal account, they're not protected, uh, they're downloaded off of the internet, but um, I was standing right in there. So this is, this is actually Texas City. And so this is the, uh, what part of the plant looked like after the explosion and the fires were put out. That beast right there is the thing called the blowdown stack. And that's where the pentane boiled out of the blowdown stack because of a loss of control in an adjacent tower and the pentane boiled out. Pentane is a, a heavier than air vapor. So it came out the, the top of the stack and then rolled down the sides, hugged the ground until it found an ignition source. And when it found the ignition source, it had a ma massive catastrophic explosion. This stuff in front of us is where the bulk of the people died. Those used to be trailers. So those were uh, just regular trailers in close proximity to this blowdown stack. And um, the fortunate thing is uh, this, this, this event happened about 1.15 in the afternoon. And um, they, the site had just uh, had a safety celebration of all things. And had a big safety lunch in a tent nearby. And uh, some people lingered over lunch and were late coming back to a one o'clock meeting in this turnaround trailer. Um, as, unbeknownst to any of them, as this particular unit, they call it the ISOM unit, physically that's where it was located, as the ISOM unit was starting up and they had the uncontrolled release, the vapor cloud explosion, deflagration, deflagration is an explosion that travels subsonically that deflagration wiped out these, tra that's, that's what used to be trailers. And that's where um, most of the 15 people died inside of those trailers. And unfortunately, and a, a lot of people that did survive, some of my friends that did survive, I didn't know anybody that died. I've met a couple of them, but I didn't really know them. Uh, a couple of people that did survive just narrowly, nearly did so. They were, I'll, I'll just tell you the story. Uh, Christoph was one of them. He was a mechanical engineer working on this project that uh, they were doing the turnaround for. Uh, Christoph had the same birthday as me. He was also left-handed like I'm left-handed. We had a lot of stuff, in co so many things in common, it was almost comical. He was considerably younger than me, but we won't talk about that. Uh, and Christoph had a young family. He was a soccer coach. He loved coaching his kids in soccer. And Christoph was in this building. He was a rotating equipment engineer waiting on uh, the meeting to start talking about this large piece of rotating equipment. Christoph survived. Next to Christoph in the, in the meeting was Jack. And Jack was an older gentleman. Jack was the one who insisted that it was safe to put the trailers right where we put the trailer, where they put the trailers. And Jack, uh, when the concussion hit, it, uh, it busted Jack's, what do you call this here, breastbone, uh, sternum, busted his sternum, and uh, Jack was knocked unconscious. Christoph right next to him, Christoph's legs were badly damaged. But Christoph had the presence of mind as all the water was pouring on to put out the fire, and these guys are underneath the, um, the debris. Christoph had the presence of mind to lift Jack's head up out of the water, or Jack would have actually ground from uh, the firefighting efforts because nobody knew they were down there. They're under a, a big, a whole lot of rubble. I say all that, sorry I elaborated so much, but I say all that because it's a, uh, this is really personal. Really personal, the lives that you're saving, you know. Uh, the stuff that we put in place, the, the elements of process safety that we talk about are there because there's blood someplace. Blood has been shed, and that's what, you know, learning from that, that blood is what leads to improving our situation. But it only, only happens if we work professionally to make sure it does so. So, 
engineers get involved in a lot of this, hazard reviews, has ops. Facility siting, like uh, where the trailers are located, is it okay to, to put trailers there, or is it in a blast zone, or is it in a, uh, you know, too close to flammable stuff? Is it uh, close to toxics? We want to make sure that we, uh, we don't locate trailers or locate permanent facilities in locations where uh, people are, are put at risk. Um, inherently safer designs. It said I was going to talk about that just a little bit. So if you're designing from scratch, one of the things, some of the things that you can do is inherently safer design. So amongst that is minimizing volumes. So we talk about minimizing risk by controlling the, the consequences, the likelihood and the consequences. If you've got less volume held up, you've got less risk because you've got less material that's available to, to catch on fire or to cause an explosion. Uh, substitution with safer materials. Is there safer material that you can use for the process or for mechanical containment? Um, and then design simplification is another element of inherently safer design, making it simple so it's easy to, to understand, easy to troubleshoot, easy to fix. There it is. So mechanic process equipment, mechanical integrity. Um, so materials of construction, fabrication, inspection, and corrosion, uh, preventative maintenance, pre-startup safety reviews, alarm and instrument management. All of these are elements that go into process and equipment integrity. This is something that our engineers work on every day. Process knowledge and documentation, understanding the process flow, process chemistry, um, safe operating limits of the facility, you know, what's the high temperature, what's the high pressure, what's the chemical composition to keep you out of a uh, uh, corrosive regime, uh, material and energy balances. So when they were starting up that tower that overflowed at Texas City, um, had they been doing, had they been doing material and energy balance, they would have known they put a whole lot of pentane into this tower that they're starting up. The pentane's got to go someplace. So actually, little known fact, one of the things I know that others don't, I'll, I'll, there was an engineer sitting beside the operator putting all the material into the, into the tower. And he, he's a layer of Swiss cheese. Had that young fella had said something to the operator that uh, you're putting all this material into the tower, when are you gonna start taking it out? Um, the tower would not have overflowed, the pentane wouldn't have come out the blowdown stack and all would be well today. So, um, you know, our engineers at, at North Atlantic, I tell you, I want material and energy balances every day. Well, there's reasons for that. It's process safety, it's, you know, it's profitability also, but uh, you gotta know how much you're putting in and how much you're getting out. It's going someplace. Um, electrical area classification, Mohammed. So uh, electrical area classification is important also. So uh, in different areas of the process facility, we have different levels of electrical um, classification for electrical protection to prevent uh, sparks from uh, being uh, you know, sources of ignition. Operating procedures. Uh, Texas City, another layer of Swiss cheese. Texas City, uh, they were starting that up without following any operating procedures. They printed off the operating procedures after the explosion occurred. They weren't doing them much good at that point. Had they been following the operating procedures, had they incorporated learnings from previous near misses that happened on startup, none of that would have happened either. Yeah, so it can be normal operations, procedures, upset conditions, and then protective systems, um, alarms, interlocks, critical alarms, relief valves, are all protective systems that our engineers work on. And then another one that I didn't actually put up there is document control. Believe it or not, just the clerical stuff of document control, having the right documents available for, uh, for review is a, a, an element of 
of process safety. So we've talked about the Swiss cheese model. So this is, uh, this is an example of the Swiss cheese model where you have a hazard here and we have these layers of protection, these slices of Swiss cheese. We have operating procedures we just talked about. We have human factors that we just talked about and the human intervenes. We had uh, uh, mechanical integrity issues. We had uh, emergency response is one of them. At Texas City, we counted up 37 different layers of protection that got violated. The holes lined it up, lined up on 37 slices of Swiss cheese that we'll, we'll have in a minute, right? 37 layers of Swiss cheese where if, if just one of those layers of Swiss cheese had not had any holes in it, the event wouldn't have happened. So I'm gonna just ask, do you all understand that concept? So these layers of protection are there, you know, hopefully we're good at all of them, but you're counting on at least one of them to prevent the accident from happening. The idea is to, you know, to work on all of them in case something else fails. So it's called layers of protection. Okay, so what's my part as an engineer? I'll, I'll boil it down to some, some easy stuff. To profess, uh, participate professionally in all your work Utilize your skills, experience, and education every day. Um, I had a, um, had a professor at Auburn who um, made a, some profound statements. He's the one that inspired me to get the, the master's in chemical engineering. He also um, uh, told us as we were getting ready to graduate, he says, you know, you guys, back then there weren't hardly any ladies in engineering, I'm sorry. But you guys can get out of here and um, you can go on about your career and you can never look back. You, could, you can do your job and never look back at what you've learned in school. He says, you'll probably do okay in your career, probably do okay in your life. But he said, um, if you really, Dr. Glenn Maples is his name. Dr. Maples said, if you wanna make a difference in this world, you'll go to work every day looking for a new way to apply the stuff that you know, apply the stuff that you learn in school, apply the experience that you get from, in my case, 36 years, and uh, apply those things to, to the world around you. Apply those things to your work, and you'll make a difference in this, this life. You'll make a difference in the work that you're doing. you make a difference in the people that are around you, okay? Uh, another thing, be a lifelong learner. This, my wife is an educator. She said, I, I said continuous improvement. She says, no, no, educators say lifelong learner. So she, uh, she put that in there, lifelong learner. Um, actively seeks ways to utilize your skills and knowledge and then keep it operating. So I said the safest state for a process plant it's when it's not running and all the, the product is out of it. A close second to the safest state is running the plant steady, running it under control, running it within its due bounds, even running it hard and um, running it steady. That's the second safest state that you can operate the plant in. The, um, the most dangerous things we do in the plant, in a process plant, are what? Startups, shutdowns, upsets, handing equipment over from operations to maintenance and handing equipment back over to operations from maintenance or from construction. Those are the five things that we do that are the most inherently dangerous in our business. So keeping the plant running, you're not having to do those things. So as we run reliably, as we run the plant reliably, we're making profits for, the, for our owners, making profits for the stockholders and, uh, and running the, safe, the plant safely. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. But I have some softball questions that are supposed to be asked because I told people I would pay them a little something if they ask softball questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dan, for the, the informative presentation. It certainly was uh, a pleasure hearing, hearing about the uh, 
uh, process safety points that you mentioned. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to the audience and if, ask if you have any questions. If you do, if you could please raise your hand and I will come over to your seat and give you the mic so that we can all hear your question clearly. I'm not talking about supersonic velocity, okay? <laughs> Hi, Don. Um, so, like, safety integrated systems are often used, and, and people think of them as the best way to add protection to a system, but um, I once heard a, a process safety engineer say that if you need a, a SIS system or a, a SIL system, that you've designed your, your system wrong. Um, I was just wondering if you had any, like, experience like, in the past with in a way, it was better to use a different approach than a, than a SIS system or a SIL system. Yeah, so I've, I've, I have. So um, SIS systems or safety integrated systems um, are, you know, I wouldn't say that they're all bad, but um, I've had some that have been installed on units where, like I say, the most dangerous time is when startups shut down. And putting in a SIS system that you have to bypass when you're doing one of those high risk activities is defeating the purpose of the SIS system. So some that I've had, you had to defeat all of, you had to bypass all of the safety integrated alarms and trips in order to start the blasted plant up. And uh, that doesn't make it any safer. So uh, there's an appropriate level of safety instrumented systems. Uh, uh, if you're starting from scratch designing a new facility, yeah, I would uh, avoid it and do the design simplification that we talked about is in the inherently safer design. And, w and I've done both of those. Anybody else? Okay, uh, we have a question over here. I'll pass this over. You were talking about building new systems, but as we all know, there's not very many new refineries in the world. There's a, the fleet of refineries is aging, and there's very few new refineries being built. And what is the long-term effect of this aging of this infrastructure? So there's no new grassroots refineries being built, but refineries are, you know, a proper refinery, a proper, proper plant you need to be continuously reinvesting capital into the plant, continuously modernizing. So our plant, believe it or not, our plant at Come By Chance is one of the last refineries built in North America. There, there's, I think there's four or five that have been built since our refinery. Um, but the way you overcome that is continuous reinvestment. So roughly 5% of the installed capital should be reinvested each year so that you, um, you know, so that you don't get caught in this trap of uh, an aging refinery. So uh, since Silver, Silver Range, our, our owners took over, we've reinvested, uh, um, somebody helped me, 200 million bucks into the plant over the last three years. So we're catching up on our reinvestment, but, but that's how you overcome that. Good question. Softballs, remember. Oh, yes, <laughs> easy softball. Can you speak to the challenges of uh, dealing with investors and, uh, and uh, the challenges of managing both safety and economics? And uh, the analogy you gave about, uh, you know, uh, a safe ship in the harbor, but it doesn't, uh, ships can't stay in the harbor. Yeah. How do you manage that, that challenge? And, and is, there, is there strong support for the safety side or the economic side, or do they both meld well together? Well, th it's... I said it's a per, uh, one of the slides, and I didn't, I didn't really highlight that. The perceived competing priorities of economics and process safety, I'll say they're, per, I, I consider them perceived pr, um, mixed matched um, priorities. Uh, the Texas City refinery um, in 19, or I'm sorry, in 2004 made roughly a billion bucks of uh, EBITDA earnings before income tax and depreciation and all that stuff. Um, on March 23rd, they gave back 
about $3 billion worth. So uh, to think that process safety was not um, in their best interest. Of course, had anybody seen this coming, they would have you know, done something to prevent it. Um, that's really, that's a poor choice of words. Some of us saw this coming. We just didn't anticipate the, 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 the um, impact that it was gonna have. So those are always competing. So, so our company is owned by investors, but I'll say they're um, nervous in a healthy way, nervous that we don't have something like this happen and uh, don't deny us funds to uh, properly um, properly make the place safe, properly reinvest. Like I say, we've reinvested, help me Catherine, 200 million bucks, just over 200 million bucks in three years. And we're gonna continue with our capital and reinvestment program going forward. So does that answer your question properly? Okay, um, maybe I'll ask a question while others maybe think if they have some. Uh, I'm wondering if you could comment just on the, the range of safety protocol for different types of industries beyond refinery. So, for example, in the nuclear industry is, is I, I just like to give you a quick example. I have a friend that works in a nuclear plant in Ontario, and the level of safety is so extreme to the point that even if there was like a light bulb in a room that is very obvious that one could just change, and I'm not exaggerating, yep. he would not be able to do it. It would have to be forms in several layers of reviews and approvals, probably a committee, and, and it's just extreme levels of safety. And then the example that you provided, uh, in which they pretty much didn't even read the procedures and were totally negligent with very little uh, safety protocol there. So I'm just wondering what, how such a wide spectrum comes and how is it that some industries like the offshore and the nuclear are at one end of the extreme and then there's such a spectrum there? Um, so so well, I'll tell you a little story. So I, I mentioned before the, before the, uh, the program that I started my career actually in a nuclear, building a nuclear power plant. And so when I was, that was as a, a young co-op engineer, like our, the work terms, all my work terms were in the power industry and the first two or three were working on a nuclear plant. So when I got out of school, I had lots of job offers from power industries, including Bechtel, to come be a nuclear, nuclear engineer with Bechtel. And so when I went to the interview with Bechtel, this was about three years after Three Mile Island had occurred, two or three years after Three Mile Island occurred. So I said, well, what is my job as a nuclear engineer with Bechtel? And they said, well, your job is to come in every day and uh, be conversant in these volumes of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's uh, protocol so that you can make proper guidance to the, um, to the users of uh, these, um, the, the power plants that we've built. And I said, so you, I'm talking to a, a young uh, nuclear engineer. I said, so you come to work every day and you read these, these regulations? I said, yeah. I said, okay. Um, you know, the mounds and mounds of paperwork may not make it all that much safer. You've, you've really got to add those other layers of protection. You've got to treat, even though nuclear, nuclear industry is not covered by process safety management, still got to do those same sorts of things. And a lot of the process safety management the elements that we're talking here actually come from the nuclear industry. So um, on the one hand, you can regulate, you can have procedures, you can have volumes and volumes of codes that um, people have to adhere to, but then at the end of the day, you're still left with a person that's gotta make a decision at two o'clock in the morning, do I run this thing or do I shut it down? So um, yeah. Texas City had, uh, that part of the plant anyway, had, uh, had really um, not been putting the right emphasis on, on process safety, many of the elements there. Um, does that answer? Okay. Uh-oh. Uh, you gave this example of uh, BP Texas City and uh, we investigated this, uh, looked into this in many contexts yeah. just for learning purpose and 
a case study. So one of the thing there was like just you said that there was one person who missed that the material balance and didn't do his. So do you see like in those cases, for example, replacing this with some uh, automated system? So for example, this case, there could be a simple calculation that could have catch that one, right? the flow rate and you know the volume and all those kind of things. So this is one question that I see like, uh, mm -hmm. do you see like scope for more putting automated system? And secondly, uh, so for example, startup and shutdown cases. So usually like uh, most of the cases, we try to build it for steady operations right. and, and those things. So do you see a need there that okay, there should be a uh, concerted effort to build things or, s or uh, safety uh, protocols or, I mean safety protocols are there, but like monitoring systems that could specifically focus on startup and shutdown cases. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think I know what you're talking about. So um, automated systems are kind of getting back to what somebody was asking about. Uh, I guess that was Matt asking about safety instrumented systems. Um, the, again, the problem with some of those safety instrumented systems, they're designed for steady state operation and um, they're a detriment when you're trying to start the plant up. They're put in so that you can have automatic shutdowns. So um, what, we're, what we prefer and what we're working on at, at North Atlantic is operator intervention automatic shutdown systems. So instead of quite being completely automated, having what we call easy buttons so that when the process gets out of control, the easy button makes the first 10 minutes worth of moves that the operator makes so that it brings the plant to a safe state while he or she is figuring out, you know, what it is that's going on. Anybody see the movie Scully? Sully? Sully? Y'all saw Sully? So Sully uh, was the guy that landed the, the airplane in, in the Hudson River and said nobody died. In the, remember that? And if you saw the movie, um, he was basically put on trial by the I guess that was the FAA or somebody that was putting him on trial. And uh, they were questioning, well, why didn't why did you land the airplane in the water? Why didn't you go to Teterboro Airport? And he said, uh, well, there was no way I could get to Teterboro Airport. And they said, well, we ran the simulation, and our pilots were able to get it to Teterboro, no problem. We could get to all the other alternate airports. Sully said, okay. Did your pilots all know that this was gonna this this event was gonna happen? That the, the airplane was gonna suck all these geese into the engine and it was gonna have a catastrophic failure? He said, "Yeah, all of the simulation pilots knew that, and uh, so they so they they didn't have to to analyze all the data. They just immediately turned to Teterboro Airport." Um, so he said, "In a." In a real life situation, I'm sitting at the airplane at the controls. I'm analyzing 20 different alarms that are hitting me all at one time. I have to have time to figure out what is going on here so that I can make the right decision to save the lives of the people that I'm flying in my 737. And uh, he said, you know, give them 30 seconds your, uh, your simulation pilot. Give them 30 seconds to sort out the data because that's about how long it took he and his co-pilot to sort out what was going on and make their decision. So um, that's our idea with the, uh, the operator intervention on the safe, uh, easy off buttons to uh, take the plant to a safe state while an operator is given a chance to figure out, okay, all this mounds of data that's coming in to me so that I can sort this out and understand what's happening and make the right call. Maybe, maybe it's not a big deal I can continue operating the plant, or maybe I need to go ahead and shut it down completely. So, long-winded. That answer your question? Yeah. Okay. How much of your uh, the process safety management do you believe is managing the attitudes of the employees? When you mentioned the uh, Texas City uh, disaster, a lot of the things that you said could have prevented it were things that were just not done by the employees. Good point. Um, and, and part of that, that is a big, that is a big part. So people don't do what you expect, they do what you inspect. You know, you can tell them to do it. 
you need to make sure. And it, in that plan, it went not just at the operator level, not just, I mean, it, it went, it was, there was more than one layer of Swiss cheese of personal accountability that got defeated of people not taking their job seriously. So yes, what role does that, the person's attitude, the people's attitudes play? It, it plays a big role. So um, one of those layers of Swiss cheese is the human factors. And human factors, the attitude of the humans can make a big difference. So, um, yeah, we, and again, it's both human factors and holding people accountable for doing their jobs. Good question. Okay, I don't see any further questions. Um, Dan, I'd just like to say again how, how much we appreciate you coming this evening. And it's, it's great to see such expertise and focus on process safety at, at, at your plant in Come By Chance. And on behalf of the faculty at this point, Dan, I'd like to offer a small token of appreciation for us from the faculty for you coming this evening. Let's all thank Dan again for coming and presenting. Oh, it's not Swiss cheese, no. <laughs> oh, very nice, thank you so much. Okay. At this point, I'd like to invite Jeff Emberley to, to come to the front and speak on behalf of Peg and Al. Thank you, Greg. It's uh, really important for us to be here and be part of this Speaking of Engineering series. It's, uh, it's uh, an important way to get the message out about engineering. and. Uh, one of our, our issues, and uh, I, I'm sure Dan would agree, is that a lot of people don't know a lot about engineering and what it contributes to society, and this is, uh, this is an important way of doing it. Just to let you know about the organization that I represent, the Professional Engineers and Geoscientists, Newfoundland and Labrador, we regulate the uh, practitioners of engineering and geoscience, and that's a, that's a pretty important public responsibility. We're given that by the pro province. It, it's an act of the province. Uh, all across Canada is regulated the same, and I think much the same in the United States as well. That each state has its state licensing board. And uh, these organizations are, in Canada at least, are uh, managed by a board of directors composed of elected engineers and geoscientists, and also government appointed uh, representatives, and uh, who are generally not engineers or geoscientists, and it's our obligation to regulate in the public interest. And that's uh, that's a really important concept and an important responsibility. Uh, I, uh, I really appreciated your comments about uh, public safety and uh, I note our, our code of ethics starts off that you hold paramount the public safety. Above everything else, it's public safety. And, but I also recognize your, your analogy with the ships, that uh, you, know, you can be totally safe but uneconomic. And, uh, you know, the challenge for engineers is doing things safety, uh, still holding the public safety paramount, but making society work. Uh, engineers are a really important part of the economic engine of all societies. And if you, if you don't manage those things properly, uh, society is the worst off for it. So uh, holding, holding public safety paramount, that's it. But making the economics of engineering work well is a really important part too. And I really appreciated hearing those comments. Uh, both generally and in de detail. Thank you very much, Dan. And uh, in addition, now, uh, Swiss cheese. Uh, there's Swiss cheese outside. Uh, well, may maybe not Swiss cheese, but there's cheese and wine. And we invite everybody to stay behind and, and chat about uh, Dan's presentation. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>